Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day. Let's sing together. Faith of our fathers living still In spite of dungeon, fire, and sword Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy Whene'er we hear thy glorious word Faith of our fathers, holy faith we will be true to thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will strive to win all nations unto thee. And through the truth that comes from God, Mankind shall then be truly free. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe. In all our strife And preach thee to As love knows how By kindly words And virtuous life Faith of our fathers Holy faith We will be true to Good morning, church, and uh, we're glad that you're here, however you join us today, and we know that uh, we haven't gathered yet together, but uh, we will soon, but we want to welcome to you our church if you're here on Facebook or on uh, YouTube or whatever means that you have, we welcome you, and if you're one of our folks, we're glad you're here. If you just happened to find us or were invited to our service, we are glad you're here as well. I want to make you aware of a couple of things that are important. Pastor Luke's away this week, so I'm going to try to fill in the announcements and get everything said that needs to be done. Sunday, July the 5th, we're going to come back together again for the first time, 11 a.m. service. That's all we're going to do that day. We're just going to do that. We've sent you a letter to give you some instructions about gathering that day if you haven't gotten that, or if you're not a member of our church and you get one, you can call the church office or you can look on our website. We'll have that information posted for you. Sunday, July the 5th at 11 a.m. Until then, uh, we'll continue to do our online uh, ministries that we've been doing. We have a Sunday school class that meets uh, at 10 a.m. on Zoom. If you have a computer and want to join us by Zoom, it's a live class. You can call the church office and we'll get you in on that or call me or uh, Pastor uh, AJ or Luke or I, or one of us, will get you plugged in to that if you want to do it. Our Wednesday evening Bible study on YouTube and Facebook, and then our daily devotionals. So we'll continue to do that uh, at, in, in the interim time. But we are gathered today on Father's Day. We hope that the Lord's blessed you. You're able to be with your father. If, if you cannot, if you're not able by distance, or if your father's gone home, or perhaps you didn't have a good father in your home, but whatever reason, know that your heavenly father loves you far more than any of us earthly fathers could ever do. Celebrate your father today. Love him, honor him, give thanks for him if you're not with him in person, but uh, we thank God for our fathers today. So we hope you have a great day and enjoy your time together. And let us pray for our service as we continue this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our fathers that are hearing this today. And we pray a special blessing for them. That you will be with them. That you will encourage them. That you will give them wisdom as they raise their families that you will give them the love and the nurture that you have shown us as our Heavenly Father. We pray for all of our families today. We pray for our church as it's gathered to hear in various places. God, we know that you're with us in spirit and truth, and we thank you for that. We pray for our worship today, that we will honor you, that all that is said and done here will be pleasing to you, to your kingdom, and to your work. Lord, we thank you for your word that we can proclaim. 
Help us do it faithfully and help us do it to the betterment of your kingdom. We thank you for Jesus who died for us, who gave us eternal life. Lord, let us celebrate that today as we worship. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. On this first day of summer, let's sing together hymn 521 on Jordan's stormy banks. chilling winds no chilling winds nor poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore sickness and sorrow pain and death are felt and feared no more i am bound for the promised land i am bound for the promised land bound for the promised land. What sweet words. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for promised land oh who will come and go with me I am bound for the promised land I love thy kingdom Lord the house of thine abode the church our blessed dream Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and brighter bliss of heaven. I want us to uh, sing a song we sang several weeks ago. It was new then. It's still fairly new now. But a, a beautiful song written by Keith and Kristen Getty titled, He Will Hold Me Fast. In the midst of difficulty, in the midst of battle, we can cry out to the Lord. Uh, we can be courageous because indeed He is holding us fast. Let's sing this, this great truth to ourselves this morning. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, Christ will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold, 
Through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Those He saves, those He saves are His delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost, his promises shall last, bought by him at such a cost. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life, he bled and died. For my life, he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast Till our faith is turned to sign He will come at last He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my sake loves me so he will hold me fast what a great truth we have to proclaim in song pastor jim is fixing to preach from joshua chapter 1 and this song comes directly from that text let's sing together Hymn number 476 this morning, Be Strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord. And be of good courage for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong. And rejoice for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided. And place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him for he will be with you in battle. 
lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage. Your mighty commander will vanquish the foe. Fear not the battle, for the victory is always his. He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice for the victory is yours. Good morning, church. It's good to see you, and uh, we're glad that you've joined us, and I hope you have a copy of God's Word with you. If you do, if you could turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, the first chapter of Joshua, verses 1 through 9. We're going to look at this great book today. I entitled our message today, Reasons to be Strong and Courageous. Reasons to be Strong and Courageous. I think this is a great text for Father's Day. It's a great text for the church. It's a great text for the situations that we see in our world, it's practical, it's common sense. I think you will uh, benefit by this. I encourage you to write down some thoughts from it, and, and this is one of my favorite texts in all the Bible. Paul reminds us over in Romans chapter 15, as he writes about the Old Testament, he says that whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Well, that is exactly what this passage today gives us. It gives us instruction. It gives us encouragement through endurance. And certainly, that gives us the opportunity to have hope. Uh, the book of Joshua is a great benefit to us. The God of Joshua is our God. God's promises and purposes were the same to Joshua as they are to us. Uh, in Joshua, we see the same principles of life and faith that we deal with. We can be encouraged. And as New Testament believers, when we read the book of Joshua, we can know that through Christ, we have hope that is fulfilled, not just theoretical. It's been realized. So we don't read it as rabbis are members of the Jewish faith. We read it as believers who know the real Savior. By the way, in, in the Hebrew, Joshua means Savior. Jesus is another word for Joshua. So we are all about Jesus in this great book. He points us to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. So whenever we read the Old Testament, it's not hard for us to find Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, we find in our text today, before I read it, that Israel is in a difficult place. Moses, their leader of many, many years, generations, is gone. They're just ready to cross into the promised land. All that God's promised them is there, but they've got to do it. Uh, Joshua is an unproven leader. His leadership has not yet been tested. The people don't know him. They're still reeling from the loss of Moses. So here is a word from God to us that spoke to Joshua and the people of Israel, and now it speaks to us. Let me read it, verses 1 through 9. Um, I like to say, and I don't know if it's entirely accurate, but there are not many passages in the Old Testament that speak as directly the words of God. We, if, if we did red letter, we always take red letter in the New Testament, we say these are the words of Jesus. If Joshua was red letter, this would be a red letter text right here, the words of God. So listen to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you 
and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west of the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. I I want you to hear that. I will not leave you or abandon you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers and give them as an inheritance. Above, Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid are discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. What a great text. Let's pray before we speak. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us clearly, powerfully. Thank you for speaking to us through this text, and we pray that your spirit will amplify this to each of us wherever we are. God, that we just won't hear it and understand it and learn some facts, but that you'll show us how much you love us how much you're involved with us, that regardless of the way our world appears, you're very much in control. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for this time that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I saw this little post this week that you'll see on your screen. I thought it was pretty funny. It, had, it was written in a bookstore, and it said, please note, the post-apocalyptic Fiction has now been moved to current affairs. I think there's a lot more truth than humor in that. A lot of believers and a lot of non-believers fear the circumstances that we're in. There is, without question, a lot of uncertainty. What happens? And just a few questions. I'm not trying to add to your uncertainty, but some things that I thought of. What happens if this virus goes on and on and on? What if Civil unrest spreads across our nation. What if, God forbid, some cities really do do away with the police? What will satisfy some radical elements of our society that seem bent on destroying our nation and anarchy? Where is God in the midst of all of this? A lot of believers are doing great and they're well-founded in their faith. But a lot of believers respond in a lot of harmful ways. Some are quiet and reflective, and though there's not anything necessarily bad about that, they're just watching. Some are probably, I would say, the majority don't know what to do. They're just waiting. Some are angry. They lash out at other people. Sometimes they lash out on social media. They may lash out at protesters or at the police or at the governor, the government, or at each other. I've seen believers this week on social media lash out at other believers and preachers and leaders who don't propose to do what they want done. They call them names like heretic and liberal and ignorant. Believer to a believer, it's hard to imagine that kind of talk. Some say that our president is the only one that can save us. Others say that anybody but him can save us. What exactly do Christians need to do? Some are discouraged, defeated, and depressed. Even the most faithful believers would say these are unprecedented times. Nobody has ever seen anything like this. So our text is very, very relevant. It's relevant to us and our situation. It's relevant to our fathers who are at home. It's a good way to manage your family, Dad. Today's passage came in a time of great upheaval in the nation of Israel. With Moses gone, trusted leadership, solid with God, led well in uncertainty and danger, and now a new era is there. Israel on the edge of the promised land. They faced fierce enemies with strong cities, a vast, untamed land that no one could imagine 
Israel could ever take by force. They had a promise from God, but how they would realize that promise would be very, very difficult. Joshua himself was unproven. Few passages in the Bible, I think, speak to us like this one. Take notes. We can learn a lot. I want to tell you a little bit about it, just an overview. The passage has a command in verse 2. It has promises in verses 3 through 5 and followed by three specific instructions for us. Let me jump right in it. Number one, God assures us that victory is secured. In verses 1 through 5, God assures us that victory is secured. Verse 1 gives us the current situation. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. There's the situation. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. God told Joshua, it's you, you're in charge. Now get everybody ready. You're getting ready to go get the land that I've promised you. And then he gives us three aspects of, of this land he's given him. I have given you, listen to verse 3, every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. He promised them the land to its full extent. He didn't say, because Moses is gone, I'm only going to be able to do half of this for you. You're only going to be able to get a part of the promised land. Every place that your foot steps, you're going to have it, just as I promised Moses. That's, that's really important. Then he says that nobody will be able to defeat you in verse 5. No one will stand against you as long as you live. That is a promise that Joshua gave Israel. Before they ever stepped the first foot into the Jordan River, they were promised victory. Church, if we're believers in Christ, before we go through the first trial or crisis, we've been promised victory. You know how this ends. You have that assurance. Same, same for us. And he tells us, Number three, that God will go with Joshua Joshua as long as he went with Moses. I will be with you just as I was with with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. There's there's a promise that's repeated in the New Testament. Jesus said that to us. He said that after he gave the great commission. He said, I will be with you always, always to the ends of the earth. God never goes back on his promises. His word is as valid today as it was then. I want you to notice something about verse 4. The territory there is absolutely enormous. A a new Old Testament scholar said that in terms of current political boundaries, the promised land covers modern Israel, the whole of Jordan, most of Saudi Arabia, half of Iraq, all of Lebanon, part of Syria, and all of Kuwait. Even at the height of Israel, in the days of David and Solomon, they only occupied a small part of this area. Was God wrong? No, he wasn't. Here's two considerations. Receiving God's promises, the first consideration, requires that the nation of Israel be faithful. Sadly, we learned that as soon as they crossed the river, they began a cycle of disobedience. And some of the land that God promised them would never be realized in their lifetime or in ours. I I just want to know how many of God's possessions, how many of God's promises, how many of God's blessings do we not get because we're not obedient to what God's told us? That was a costly lesson for the nation of Israel. But the second thing that's really important, really exciting, is God is telling Israel, some land you'll have in this age, the rest, when Christ comes in the millennial age, that'll be the definition of the millennial city of Jerusalem. So some of this land was seen in the nation of Israel. Some of this land will be seen in the future. God's prophecy covers from the time he spoke to Joshua all the way to the end of time. No part of God's plan is incomplete. No part of it's not true. No part of it will not ultimately be fulfilled. Take the promises of God just as God told Israel that you will have every step of land that you put your foot on, it'll be yours. It'll, I promise you that. Take that as surely as he did for Israel. We have to learn and understand the promises of God. They're real to us. Over in the New Testament, there are promises galore in the Bible. One of them, and I, I just want to share a couple with you. We don't have a lot of time, but I want to share a couple of promises with God in the Old Testament. When Jesus was instructing his disciples, one of my favorite passages, Peter said, Lord, we've left everything and followed you. What will there be for us? Here's a promise 
from Christ. He said, I tell you that in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his throne, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are will be last, will then be first. Jesus said, you will never give up anything in the kingdom of God that you aren't rewarded for. That, that's a promise. He's encouraging disciples. He's discouraging, encouraging followers. He's encouraging us that we can follow him, that we can pour our life into serving Christ, and we'll be rewarded for that. Over in Matthew chapter 24, he tells us, learn this lesson from the fig tree. Another promise, as soon as the branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know the summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things, recognize that he is near at the door. This generation will not pass until all of these things have come to pass. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, guys, I've given you all these signs about my return. I'm going to come back. And just as surely as you look at a fig tree and you see when it's about to have figs, the the leaves become ripe, the blossoms come on the tree, you know the figs are coming. Jesus told his disciples, he tells us that when you see these signs coming the past, you know the end is near. Church, that's a promise from God. Live expectantly. Know that God is in control. He's sovereign over all of these things. Nothing is out of his hand. He's in sure control of this. And so God gives us a glimpse at what he would give Israel as they cross the promised land. Number two, uh, let, let me just say a word about the instructions here. In these last verses, we've seen a picture of what the future Israel would look like. And then he gives us three important repetitions. And that is, be strong and courageous. We see it in verse 6, be strong and courageous. We see it in verse 7, be strong and courageous. We see it in verse 9, be strong and courageous. There's a, there's a real trend there. Be strong and courageous. That's necessary for them. But each one of those commands is attached with a particular instruction that we need to listen to. Let me tell you, you know what strong is. That is the quality of being physically strong, the capacity of an object to withstand great force or pressure. That's what strength is. Courageous is not deterred by danger or pain. God is telling Israel, telling us to be strong and courageous. I've probably never quoted Mahatma Gandhi in any kind of sermon, but he said something I thought, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attitude of the strong. And Napoleon, here's, I've never quoted Napoleon either. Courage isn't having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. God gives us three specific instructions that we need to be strong and courageous in order to accomplish them. Let me go through them with you. First, he says, be strong and courageous to manage the gifts and the resources that God gives us. Listen to verse verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers and give them as an inheritance. When the nation of Israel would would arrive in the promised land, God would said to them, you're going to have to be strong and courageous not to take the land, but to distribute the land and the blessing that God has given us. It was a foreign nation. It wouldn't be laid out by a real estate developer. They would have to go in there and decide who would live where, and God would give them instruction on that. They would, in order to do that and to occupy that land, they would need to be strong and courageous. If you gave me a thousand dollar bill or a thousand dollar check and you said, Here, Jim, is a gift from me. And if I took that thousand dollar check and I put that in a frame and hung it on the wall of my office, it wouldn't do me any good at all. I would have to take that thousand dollar check, take it to the bank, convert it to cash, and then put it to use. That's what God is saying to Israel. When you arrive in the land, you haven't just arrived. Now you've got to put to use the gift that I've given you. You've got to distribute it out to the people of Israel. How many believers are not strong and courageous because they haven't taken what God has given them and applied it to themselves? Maybe it's something they hoped for. Maybe it's something they worked for. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's a talent. Maybe it's, it's something that God has instructed them to do, but they've just sat on it for year after year after year. It's very, very important. When I was called to ministry, I knew that God had called me to ministry. But it took strength 
and courage to put that call into action. Now, God gave me that, but I had to be willing to do it. And before you think I'm bragging on myself, I would have to tell you that it took me 25 years for me to have the strength and the courage to do what God called me to do. But God had called me. I had to, I had to do what God had called me to do. And yet he, he still was patient with me in that process. We have to be able to distribute and use the gifts that God's given us. We have to first know and trust God in order to do that. We have to, we have to be aware that God is personally leading our life. We, we have to let God personally lead our life. God will speak to us in times of study and prayer and move us and give us a call and give us a sense of direction, give us motion for us to go to. We have to be obedient to his word. We're going to talk more about obedience. We have to be connected to God because God's plan is going to change. He's going to adjust. It's going to go through different ideas. You're going to have to take one step, and God's going to move you over here. But we have to distribute the gifts to do that, and in order to do that, we have to be strong and courageous. Number three, be strong and courageous and carefully obey his word. That's down in verse 7. Above all, listen to that, above all, be strong, and notice this, very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my service my servant Moses commanded God told Joshua be strong and he upped the level of courage and he said very courageous be very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction of my servant Moses the wa- the, the instruction that God's talking about is the law of Israel he he told Joshua that in order to, to fulfill this promise, you've got to carefully observe the law as it's written. You've got to carefully follow the instructions. Church, you and I have to carefully follow the whole instruction that God has given us. That's, that's an absolute necessity for us. We can't call ourselves believers and live the way we want. We can't call ourselves believers and, and respond to every situation just the way that our emotions or our gut or our past experiences or our friends respond. We have to respond in a way that's consistent with God's word. And he gives us here three very specific instructions on how we obey the word. First of all, he says, don't turn from it, from the word, to the right or the left so you will have success wherever you go. You got to follow the word. It's like following a trail. Think of a trail. If you if you take a little bit of a, le- a deviation off a trail, you get real lost. If you take a little deviation off the word of God, you go far away from God's intent. He says, first thing you've got to do is you've got to carefully follow it. Don't turn from it from the right or the left. Meticulously follow the word of God. Get into it and know it and learn it and listen to it and let it change your behavior. Success requires that you do that. Don't turn from the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. That's the, that's the requirement for success, is to take the Word of God and follow it without deviation from point A to point B. That's ne- absolutely necessary. And then the second element, instruction about obeying His Word, it says this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You've you got to about to talk about it constantly. Think about Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. That's the Shema. All the, Hebrew, all the Hebrew parents would recite that to their children. And this is what it says. Talk, about, talk to them about it when you sit on your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. The, the parents of Israel were instructed to take God's word and use every possible opportunity to instruct them on following that word. Everything. When, when you lie down, when you walk down the road, when you get up, w- when you sit down at the dinner table, that's a great time to talk about the Word of God. You, you talk about that Word. It must not depart from your mouth. Talk about it with other believers. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it with your family. Talk about it with your children. Talk about it with your neighbors. Talk about it with the people you work with. Don't let that Word depart from your mouth. Good dinner time talk. And then thirdly, we're called to meditate on it day and night. Now, that's a little bit different than talking about it or reading it. That's medit- That's thinking about it, taking Scripture and thinking about it. One, one way to meditate on Scripture is to take an index card and write a verse on it and walk around and meditate on that verse all day. 
And every time you stop at a stoplight, don't, don't, don't get too caught up in it because you're going to miss the stoplight and people will be blowing the horn at you. But, but meditate on it. Think about that scripture. Pray about that scripture. What does it mean to you? How can it be applied to you? What, what would you adjust your life to? And, and you're seriously involving scripture in the word in your life. Psalm 119.97 says, I delight in your commands, which I love. I delight. That's, that's a way to meditate. You delight in God's commands. The result of meditation is to carefully observe everything that's written in it. So then you will prosper in everything that you do. You will have success. And it says the result of meditation that you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. You see, the necessary part of success is that you get into the Word of God, that you follow it meticulously for success. You can't get that success on your own. You can't do that by your own reason. You don't, you don't get through a difficult situation by responding to circumstances the way you feel or the way you see other people, but you do it the way the Word of God tells you to do it. And church, when you do that, you find yourself growing closer and growing in the way God wants you to grow. Then you will prosper and succeed at everything you do. Here's the secret to our success, to managing crisis. When we're broken, when we're uncertain, when we're without direction, when we're angry, you name it, this is the fix. Your time in God's word is directly proportional to your success in the circumstances of your life. Let me say that again. Your time in God's word is directly proportional to the success you have in life circumstances. The more time you spend in his word, the more success you're going to have. The more rightly you're going to respond to circumstances, the more God's going to change you and move you and alter your direction. It's absolutely essential that you are strong and courageous to follow his word in everything that he does. And that's a difficult task. It's difficult to adjust your life according to the world, according to the word. The world is not the, wor the word's way. So be strong and courageous. Fourthly, be strong and courageous to not be afraid or discouraged because he is with us everywhere I go. Now, verse 9 tells us that. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's a commandment. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. And it's, it's, um, this is an echo of what's up in verse Five, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. He is with us wherever we go. It's repeated. God wants to be with us. He has promised his presence with us. In, in Old Testament Israel, God would be with Joshua the leader, and God would represent it himself through Joshua to the people of Israel. You and I have the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us to guide us. We have a promise from God that he is always with us and will never, ever desert us. God graciously assures Joshua that the Moses blessing was his. And, and I'll tell you, I, I love the thought that God's more committed to us than we were ever committed to him. The key to God's power is that he is always with us. Church, you are never alone. You are never abandoned. He has never cast you out. We can read all the blessings in the New Testament, but I think some of the most precious is that God has adopted us into his family, that he is with us all the time through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He can guide us and teach us and encourage us and love us and instruct us. I am with you always to the end of the age. One of my favorite figures in biblical history is Dr. Hudson Taylor. He was a great missionary to China in the late 1800s. And he said, and this was from one of his earlier books, he says, I am a little servant of a great and illustrious master. All of God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they counted on him being with them. Did you hear that? Being a great person in God is not about who you are, about your skills, about your leadership ability, not about your wisdom or your discernment or all the good decisions you make. The great things that God can do in a person is when we allow we're not able and let God do it and be with him. I love to see this in Mark chapter 2 and 
a, a pastor brought this to my attention. When Jesus called his disciples in Mark chapter 2, the first thing that he called his disciples to do was to be with him. Not to do miracles, not to teach, not to start the church, but first and foremost, their job, their task was to be with him. Church, you and I need to be with him. How does that happen? It happens to us in his word. As we read and study the word of God, God speaks to us, which is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. It happens to us through the Holy Spirit. Christ lives in us. The Holy Spirit will caution us. It will warn us. He, he will instruct us. He will encourage us. He will burden us when he's with us. You can silence him. You can ignore him. You can disobey him. But if you listen to him, we, we can learn to listen to him, learn to respond to him. God is with us is the most powerful thing about God, that we are never, ever alone. Listen to that. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be intimidated by your circumstances. Let me... Let me take this to a conclusion. Let me say this. We, that you and I as believers, we don't lash out in anger because we know the kingdom of God is here and working in believers through the Holy Spirit. We, we don't have to be angry. God is sovereign over COVID-19 and God is sovereign over the unrest in our nation. Sin and brokenness is the root of racism and violence and hatred and revenge. And yes, church, there is racism that we have to deal with. Christ's ways are not the world's ways. We always follow Christ. And our ways will always look different from other people's ways. Don't ever join in just because everybody else does it. And I want you to know that we recognize the signs that Christ is coming soon. I don't know if he's coming imminently, but he could return at any moment. Watch what you post on social media. Let the Holy Spirit guide every comment, every post, every word. Be Christ-like in everything that you do. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Yes, love them too, Jesus told us to do that. Love yourself. Never despair or be discouraged. Be careful not to attack other believers. Don't attack your church. Don't attack other faiths. Don't attack your enemies. For believers, Matthew 18, 15. I'm just going to tell you that. Just write down Matthew 18, 15. Go look at it. That's a good order for believers today. That basically says if somebody offends you, go to them personally. Don't put it on Facebook and Twitter. You want to see anger and see anger directed at Southern Baptist pastors who support racial unity. I've seen it all over the Internet this week. Don't be like that. Most of all, none of us should ever be overcome by our circumstances. Circumstances can stop us cold. I mean, they can overwhelm our life. They can stop our ministry. They can get us out of all the patterns that we're comfortable with. They can make us forget God's promises. They can force us to look at our helplessness and know that, the, that Satan does that. But know that circumstances like the death of a loved one or a career that's lost a person that we adore moves on for one reason or another. An opportunity that we desperately saw it is gone. Bad news after bad news. God is never abandoning us in the midst of circumstances. Be strong and courageous. Not because you are great, but because God is great. He has promised you an eternal heritage and has detailed it for you in his word. Be strong and courageous as you carefully obey his word. Be strong and courageous because his son died on your behalf to give you eternal life. Trust him entirely. Take from Joshua that God is entirely sufficient for you. It is said of Hudson Taylor that he put to test the promises of God and proved it possible to live a consistent spiritual life on the highest plane in the most difficult circumstances. He overcame difficulties such as few people have ever had to encounter. He left a work that's still growing in China. Inland China opened to the gospel largely as an outcome of his life. Millions of people were won to Christ from in a previously unreached area of the world. 1,200 missionaries, when he left, depended on God for the supply of all their needs. 
in every way. He depended on God. What was his secret? And he wrote, the fathomless wealth of Christ. He understood what we need to know to always be with Christ. Our first step to the kingdom is knowing that you can't do this on your own. You can't under, over, overcome the circumstances of the world. You can't overcome the difficulties in our life. You can't be encouraged in the face of a difficult world on your own. You can only do that through Christ. Once you are there, you can let him do what you can't do. And believer, know that you have God's word. You have all of it. It is entirely sufficient. Know it. Meditate on it day and night. Obey it. Don't waver from the left or the right from it. His word amplified by spirit. What more do you need? We don't need anything else to raise a family, to run a church, to work in this world, to be encouraged with these circumstances, to know how to respond in difficulty. God's promises to us are real and eternal. They are concrete and secure in the blood of Christ from the cross. Therefore, today, in difficult days, we can be hopeful and secure as our world falls apart. Just as God said it would. What a blessing we have to have God's word. Let me pray with you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we know that you are sovereign and in control that you love us and have provided a way for us. Lord, I pray that if there is one here today that does not know you, that you will lead them to the cross to recognize their sin and failure and know that you love them and have pursued them through Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll lead them to the cross. And if there's others that here today that are discouraged or worried or troubled or burdened or angry, God, I pray that you'll restore in them the Christ-like spirit that you have intended for us, that you'll make us lights shining in a dark world, to be an encouragement, to be strength, to be a source of hope in this world. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who died for us, and his, in his name we pray, amen. Church, I invite you, whatever God puts on your heart, maybe to come to faith in the first time, maybe to renew your faith, Maybe to serve in a different way. Maybe to reach out to someone who's discouraged. I encourage you to do that. And if we can help you in any way, you contact us here at the church. We're available. Give us a call. We'll be glad to sit down with you. God bless you. Yeah.